Hi, this is Levi. Before we get into this episode, I wanted to take a quick minute to introduce a few of the other podcasts in the WCF Podcast Network. Tom and Naomi are exploring how we interact in our ecclesial relationships in From the Platform. It's a very in-depth series that is incredibly helpful for understanding and developing compassion and better listening practices. That's From the Platform. Sam Taylor from Cleveland, Ohio, produces weekly devotionals in Pause to Consider. Think uh, Mr. Rogers meets uh, Fireside Chat. I love Sam's humble style and think every episode is fantastic. You can find both of those wherever you get your podcasts or on our website at wcfoundation.org. Now, here's the show. Welcome back to A Little Faith. This is a podcast sponsored by the Williamsburg Christadelphian Foundation. A Little Faith podcast explores both the challenges and hope of living a life of faith. I'm Steve, and I'm here with Rebecca Lewis. Today, we're going to be talking about parenting, the experience of isolation as a parent, and how that can shape our faith. Rebecca is going to share some of her experiences and positive ideas to help people help others and help themselves if they're struggling with isolation as a parent. Rebecca, it's wonderful to be here with you. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, I'm a a mum of three children. I I grew up a Christadelphian. I married a Christadelphian. Um, And my, my husband left the Christadelphians a few years ago. And after that, we decided to have children. So I took my children to church on my own, um, which was was quite hard. Um, diffi- probably a little bit more difficult than it would have been if my husband had been there too. Um, but it did make me realise that even when both parents are able to take their children to church. It is challenging being there with children Um, because I don't know whether anyone's noticed, but they're not very good at sitting still and being quiet. Um, But also it felt isolating at home. And I I realised that all parents must experience this. Um, Just the physical isolation of being on your own without another adult there with children to look after. Uh, and even if you're quite an outgoing person and you want to go out and visit people, you can't always. You're stuck in because of quarantine or, you know, so it's just come down with chicken pox. That's a whole month written off at home. Um, but you, you can't go out in the evening so much. Uh, and it all sounds really obvious when you say it out loud. Like, why, why, why do I need to talk about this? But I think... Um, it did affect me a lot more than I expected it would. And it made me realise how before children, I probably wasn't that understanding of what parents go through. Um, and I felt it was an important thing to share that, that that was a struggle, even though it was such a wonderful time as well. Um, and, and my children were all healthy. I had support from friends and family. I, I didn't feel... Like, I couldn't cope necessarily. I did sometimes, as you do when you don't have enough sleep. But for the most part, it was just a natural human experience. Um, And I think there were parts of our Christadelphian culture, but also just Western culture generally, which made it more difficult than it needed to be. Um, And I think if we can all try to make it that much easier when it's such a challenging time in, in someone's life, then that's that's a good thing to do. So it it took me a while to get my head around all all my newborn fog that you get into when you have children that you you are so sleep deprived and everything's so new and you don't really have a clue what's going on. You're just kind of trying to survive each day. Um, but after my children were a little bit older, by the time my little little boy was nearly two, I felt able to a bit more articulate what I'd been through. And um, my friend Richard 
who is an edit is the editor of uh, the CIL magazine, asked me to write an article on what it's like being a parent and feeling isolated. Um, and I'm really grateful that I was asked to do that because it made me just put all my thoughts together. It was very cathartic. I was able to write out lots, write down lots of stuff that, um, you know, made me feel frustrated, um, hard times that I'd had. And then I was able to neaten it all up and put it into a little package of something that might be positive and help people to help others really and help themselves if they're struggling. So, um, one thing that you talked, you said uh, things in Christadelphian culture and Western culture. What are the what what kinds of things are you talking about that that lend themselves to this problem? Yeah, um, I think I think we're starting to come out of it now, but I, I think certainly, um, I think we have unrealistic expectations as to what children can cope with. Um, in a you know formal environment, um, our services tend to be very long. Um, they're expected to be quiet and still. And if they can't be, then we go in another room. Um, and it, I, I didn't really think about it until I became a parent myself. It seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing to expect a child and a parent to be in another room so that everyone else can hear, and so that there's not disruption. Um, but the more I sat in that back room, child after child, year after year, um, the more I thought, actually, I don't think this is necessarily reasonable to expect this physical isolation for both the child and the parent. Um, there must be a way of including the children more in what's happening so that the parents can be included as well. Um, and I think... I do think that's quite a, a Western way of, of doing things. Um, I've, I've lived in um, a non-Western country for five or six months before children, and they seem to do things very differently and, and just generally be more relaxed. Um, and I started to think if, if Jesus came to the ecclesia, the, the way he used to approach people who are on their own and search out people who were on the fringes, I thought, actually, who, where, where would he go to sit during the service? And it made me think, well, actually, he probably would go and sit in the back room. Um, and that's where I thought, yeah, I, I, this needs to change, really. That's a lovely idea. I, I, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, we have our... It's our side room. It's in our back room. Yeah. Our collegia with a monitor on the wall and the cameras mm -hmm. there. And there's the PA system, whatever. But in a rocking chair and a sofa. But yeah, you're you're over there. Yeah. You know, not part of that group. Sometimes it's nice if you've if you've hardly had any sleep. You can have a cup of tea, put your feet up, close your eyes. You don't have to worry about what the speaker's thinking. <laughs> um, but yeah, other times it just. It does really feel like you, you think, well, actually, I could have listened to this at home um, and my children would probably be more settled and happy. I would have probably heard more. And I, I can't really talk to people after the meeting very much because I either need to leave straight away or I have to change a nappy or I've got to tidy up all the toys or I've got to follow around my toddler because they just want to walk constantly. Um, so why, why am I here? Um, I'm really grateful to a, a good friend of mine who started to sit out in the back room with me, even though she, she had no children. And um, she just realised that I needed the company and the support, and that just helped so much. That's a, that's a great, that's super. Yeah. yeah. That's a nice suggestion. Yeah. You know, if somebody picked up on that, to just say, you know, I'm going to go sit back there because I'll hear it. Yeah. The PA, but the person won't feel like they're all alone. Yeah. The, but the basis of uh, this, uh, the podcast is called A Little Faith. So mm -hmm. the idea is to talk about faith issues and help people in some small way, hopefully, um, to develop faith or preserve faith and that sort of thing. Um, did you feel like this was really in a 
fundamental way, the, the child rearing and uh, going through, and especially since you sort of lost some help with that, that your faith was suffering? Or how, did, how did you know that this was not a good thing? Or did you feel like you were in trouble? I think, yeah, I don't think I felt in trouble. Um, I, I don't think my, I felt like my faith was being jeopardised necessarily, but um, I... In, in a way, it made me appreciate it more because I realised I was getting really sort of thirsty for more spirituality in my life. So in a way, it made me appreciate that side of my life more. It made me realise that it was very important to me. Um, I felt a challenge towards my own. I think it, it brought up in myself. I, I realised there were parts of my character I needed to work on because you just realise... Um, when you overreact to a child or, you you know, they, they push your buttons and you you get more angry than maybe you should do, you think, well, this is all me here. It's just me in the house. This is something I need to work on. Um, it's not anything that's happening externally to me, really. This is all part of my own character. Um, and if I'm being triggered by the children into saying things that phrases that I wouldn't normally say that have just appeared into my head from when I was little myself maybe that I heard adults say um then I need to work on that and I need to develop my own character really and also I found I was overacting about things that, and I thought well actually that that isn't that important in the grand scheme of things what I'm uh, getting worked up about does that really matter probably not and it was the same with um church as well in that I, I started to think well actually I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself to have children that are behaving really well or um to be useful to other people to achieve something that day that is um worthwhile um and actually do I need to put that pressure on myself do I need to feel that I need to be this amazing mum who is always spiritually minded and um, has the right answer for everything. And I thought, well, no, I, I it, this isn't all down to me. Um, this is where I need help from God and from Jesus. Um, they, they are the only ones that will help me through the day. It's not all down to me. Uh, so it helped me rely more on, on God than myself really and and dealing with the unpredictability of children as well that they they mess around with your schedule they um will suddenly get ill or they'll suddenly have a meltdown and you will be late or you'll have to say oh I'm sorry I really can't make it today and I I used to be someone I felt that people could rely on if I said I'd be there I would be there I might be a little bit late because I'm not very good at timekeeping but I would be there um and I had to accept that I couldn't necessarily be relied upon anymore um, and that going to church wasn't now all about how I could support other people, but it was also about how they could help me. Um, and that was quite humbling, really. Uh, but, yeah, it, I, think, I think that's how it affected my spirituality. It was, it was making me realise I needed to rely on others more and I needed to rely on God more. So... Yeah, I think I think for me it wasn't putting my faith in jeopardy necessarily, but it made me relook at what was important and what I wanted to pass on to my children. And I also felt that with children, you're you're basically as a parent, you're modelling God to them. You are their idea of God, really. We always describe God as our father and he's described in a very kind of parental way in the Bible. And when when they get older and they think of God as their father, they are going to relate to God the way that they've related to their parents. And, and that kind of made me realise I needed to grow myself and, and really work at modelling how Jesus would be in, in my house. Um, and, and so when... I found that I was being maybe not as patient as I could be. Um, I, I thought, well, 
I need I need to work on this. And and I felt that when I was um, overreacting or getting worked up about things, it really didn't matter. It was almost like I was pushing God out of the house. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you know it was he he was the focus. Um, and I think that's one of the things that having children does is it makes you reassess what's important and and what parts of your faith are important as well. Sure. Because you feel a great deal of responsibility for yeah. steering these beings in the right direction and having them end. It's such a long process that it's a big job Yeah. to do that. And the responsibility is there to... Am I going to mess this up? I don't want to mess these people up. <laughs> Love is patient. Love is kind. A lot of times that's kind of my mantra or mm. something when I'm being upset, mm. irritated by something. Love is patient. Love is kind. But it's kind of hard. Like when you have children who are being... Children. Are being children. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I can't believe it. I saw those pictures of your children. I haven't met them, but they're adorable. They are adorable. They're so sweet. <laughs> How could they possibly be? Um, what advice would you give to new parents to ensure that they don't feel isolated? Um, I think I think the main thing is to not feel like you have to do it on your own. I think, particularly in our culture, there's an idea that you have to be able to cope in your small family that you don't need external help. And I think particularly in terms of our church life, we really need to try and include other people in that family to, to extend the family outwards. And one of the main reasons to do that is to ask for help. But it's it's quite hard to articulate what kind of help you need sometimes. But I guess what I'm trying to say is not to feel like you're failing as a parent if you need help and support, but that that's normal. Um, one practical thing that really helped me was having wireless headphones because I could walk around with the headphones on, I could listen to something, I could watch TV, I could listen to podcasts, listen to church talks and... If the baby was crying, maybe they had colic or something, I'm just marching around the house with them. That was a really important adult connection um, where I felt like my brain was being fed, um, my spirituality was being fed, but I was still looking after my baby. Um, and that, that really, really helped. Um, online, I developed more friendships online, um, Facebook groups and things with other Christadelphians um, and found more information online, more talks, more articles. Um, yeah, I guess I, I kind of started to build up my own new support network of different people who um, I could call on for help or know that I'd be able to see regularly. Um, I started to plan ahead a bit more with school holidays. So I, I used to find at first, suddenly all the all the little classes I'd take my children to, um, all the people I would see, all the people I would see, um, they would suddenly disappear during school holidays. And I was just left thinking, oh, I've got I've got no one to see this week. <laughs> so I um I now plan ahead. I book people in before they book with other people just to make sure that we've got regular contact with other people and it's not just us. Um, oh, yeah, and the main thing I think was <coughs> um, when you are stuck in on your own, um, if you're potty training or whatever, is to um, start to develop your children as your companions. So to not feel like you need to hide your feelings from them or your struggles, but to share things with them, share how you're feeling, share your jobs with them as soon as you can so that you feel like you're, you're in it together and, and, you're, and, and, the, and they will start hopefully to understand when you're having a bad day, how they might be able to cheer you up and, and that it's okay to be a grown-up and to not be necessarily happy and breezy all the time. Um, and then I think once you're able to 
kind of cultivate that understanding with your children and and they as they get older it just gets much easier and they're you know it's they're your friends then they become more sensitive too yeah yeah which is good because that's what people need to learn how to do yeah yeah Hmm. you had uh, other you you threw out uh, several suggestions early in this like Mm. someone who would come and sit with you Mm. and everything but um what what other suggestions are there for uh, new parents and uh, practically and spiritually that that uh, would help that help them? So how other people could help? Um, I think I think one of the main things is just to as a parent you tend to be very overly sensitive about how you're doing and worry that you're basically screwing your children up all the time. So. I think parents need to be encouraged and reassured that they're welcome and that the children are welcome at church um, and that you're really, really pleased that they're there and that you see them as important to the future of the church. So just extra reassurance is always really welcome um, and willingness to provide toys and spare clothes and white wipes and everything that you could possibly need to make things a bit easier I think it's just the tiny little touches can make all the difference mm. try to keep parents in the loop about things because they're probably going to miss out on the news in church and what's happening so try to keep them included with texts or emails if someone's someone in the church isn't well so that their parents can feel like you know they can at least send a card or phone or, or something to, to just feel like they're still able to help where they can um i i went to a um kind of coffee morning um that a, an elderly sister organizes uh, where she she had kept all the toys from when her children were small and would get them out on the living room floor and the children would play while we listened to a talk um and just just the the warm welcome and the coffee and cake and and it was just lovely and really made a difference because that was basically my my talk of the week I was going there um and i think the main thing for me is just being willing to be flexible um if parents ask that maybe the times of something can be different or the format of something can be slightly different or slightly shorter um, they're asking because if if it's not, then it's it's incredibly difficult for them to be there. Um, and so just to be aware that if they're asking for those things, it's it's because they really need it and they're not just doing it to be awkward. Mm. Um, and also just generally with friends as well, if, if you're um, able to meet up with them last minute rather than have to organise well in advance, that helps because you just don't know what the children are going to be like on the day. So I, I found it really beneficial to have people who would just say, oh, when, when it's a good time for you, just feel free to pop round, just give me a call, just, you know, a couple of hours before and you can come around and visit. And that, that was great because whenever we tend to plan ahead in advance, it usually gets postponed or cancelled or whatever. And then you just feel like you're letting people down. So just, just general flexibility um, really helped me, I think. Mm. We hear good ideas all the time, and then nothing necessarily happens with them because they were just good ideas. <laughs> how how do you get an ecclesia to act on good ideas? And... Yeah, that's a hard one because it's at a time in your life where you really don't have the energy to be persistent. Um, so I think it's it's just trying to help on a more one to one basis to help people understand where you're coming from because they won't just automatically know I mean, even parents can forget how hard it is a few years down the line um so I think it's just personal relationships really uh, and patience um but also just remembering that your children are the future of the church and so you're not just doing it for you and you're not just doing it for them but you're doing it for the whole community really and that can help you maybe be a little bit more persistent than you might normally be about things. Mm-hmm. That's good. Any anything else that uh, we haven't covered? That you think? Um, I think 
Oh, yeah, I guess I'd like to say, um, obviously, being a parent is wonderful. And um, my children had they had a you know, perfectly healthy start to life. Um, and it, it, this is, whole experience has just made me realise that for those people who whose children aren't so healthy or that maybe they're single parents bringing up children on their own, just how hard it is or must be for them. Um, and I, I don't want to sound like, you know, I'm complaining about being a parent because I love it. It's just... Um, this is part of a natural human experience is to be a parent. And I think we just need to help people through it as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Be sensitive. Be aware. Yeah. Anyway, because of other people's... Of what's going on around is yeah. difficult a lot of times for people because we're people. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're aware... And, some of, and the idea of this uh, this session is... To raise awareness. Mm. People think, because I'm thinking about our video, our baby room now in my head, you know, thinking, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, we could do some things. Or I know the parents go off and sit over there, and I never really think about mm. it. Like, yeah, it didn't, it didn't occur to me, because I guess you just think about the one child, and you think, well, it'll just be a year or two. But then you have more, if you have more than one child, uh, there's, um, you know, my eldest is eight now and my youngest would still not sit through a normal traditional meeting. So that's, you know, pretty much a decade of my life where I'm, I'm not so able to participate or contribute even. Yeah. It is reasonable for people to be able to feel like they can focus in a meeting. Um, but I think... That goes both ways. So if a parent is never able to sit in a meeting and focus because they're always with the child, then maybe one or two of the meetings in an ecclesial calendar can be more child-friendly. Um, and then the other thing is, is, I suppose, it occurred to me that actually this is often the parent's only quiet time of the week. Um, where they do get to just sit still and maybe listen. Uh, whereas I think some of the other people who are used to quiet all week find it more distracting when it's not quiet. But perhaps if they can remember that during the week, they will probably have some moments where they can sit and have some uninterrupted quiet. And that's their un uninterrupted quiet. Um, maybe they can it can help them be a bit more patient, I guess. <laughs>